So this story begins about 15 years ago when I started as a graduate student in a laboratory of Dr. Kevin Passano at the Ohio State University. Kevin was an interesting guy. I sat down with him and said, Kevin, what class is it going to take? I am a PhD student in electrical engineering. And he said, we definitely don't want you taking electrical engineering courses. You're going to get plenty of electrical engineering interacting with me and all the people around us. And your job as a PhD student is to grow our discipline. So I want you to go out and take advanced mathematics, statistics, and actually a lot of biology. Go out and take some evolution courses, and courses in behavioral ecology, because we want to grow this thing, and we're not going to do that by you taking courses that you're going to get anyway by doing the projects here. So I thought, well, you know, that's kind of interesting. Um, and so I've, you know, in being around people like Kevin for the last, say, 15 years or so, I've given a lot of thought to what do we mean by discipline. So if you look up discipline, these are some definitions you can get. Uh, a branch of knowledge, typically one studied in higher education or a field of study. But when you walk around the halls of higher education, you start feeling some of the other definitions. So um, as one example, orderly or prescribed conduct or pattern of behavior. I often will bump into my colleagues, especially the young ones, and I'll say, great, you know, you, you should meet this other faculty member in this other department. And they're working on this interesting problem, and I think that, uh, that you, you, you could contribute. And they'd say, you know what, uh, that, that, that might be something I could contribute to, but not, not right now in my career. Um, I need to stick to what is going on in my discipline. And they start thinking, <clears throat> so what, what should I do? They start looking to other people in their discipline to say, what are other people in my discipline doing? So our disciplines give us a template. They're, uh, they're very powerful. So we can ask, where do they come from? Now when I think about disciplines, I think about things like these starling flocks. So they're beautiful, these murmurations, right? Um, and uh, so down at the bottom it says, where do disciplines come from? Um, and in these starling flocks, when we look at these, um, we might, uh, you know, uh, wonder, do these, do these formations, do these flocks actually have any function? But in reality, these flocks themselves, a biologist will tell you that the actual shape of these macroscopic structures don't have any function. They're actually the result of each starling playing it safe. Each starling is trying to minimize its risk of predation, so it gets as close to the other starlings around us, and you get these beautiful structures. That's why I think of our discipline sometimes, is that we get closer and closer to those around us to play it safe, and we form these structures that we worship, but in the end, it's not clear that they're functional. In fact, sometimes when I think about that, that faculty friend that I talked about who I said, you know, you should go meet up with this other one, what they'll tell me is, no, you know, I'll do that after I get tenure. Discipline, punishment inflicted by, uh, by way of correction and training. Discipline to bring a state of order and obedience by training and control. Discipline to punish or penalize in order to train and control, to correct, to chastise. Again, in that story, I'll tell these, these guys, you know, you should meet up, you know, faculty A and faculty B should come together, and they'll say, if I did that, there's no way I could ever get tenure. Um, those are things I save after I've gotten tenure. So discipline, it's, it, it's very controlling. And maybe it's a good thing, but we have to ask, what costs do we pay when we take these disciplines for granted? And that brings me back to another story that started back when I was a grad student. So this is a beautiful picture taken by Alex Wild of an ichmanumid wasp, a parasitoid wasp. And when I was with Kevin in grad school, Kevin said, when you look at that, don't think of that as an object for entomology or an object for biology. When you look at that, you've got to realize that that fits into a set of things that go right along with this autonomous helicopter or this autonomous underwater exploration vehicle or this autonomous vacuum cleaner. They all are making decisions, and we need to view them by what they're doing and not who studies them. You say, well, what sort of decisions is this wasp making? Well, back in the 80s, some behavioral ecologists looked at wasps like these, and they said, you know, it's interesting. These wasps have a finite number of eggs, and they have to lay them in a finite number of places, and they can't lay the same amount of eggs everywhere. They have to decide how many eggs to lay in each place. So they picked up operations research textbooks off the engineering shelves and built these optimization models. The details don't matter, but these mathematical models, and they accurately predicted where the wasp was laying those eggs. But wasps aren't doing calculus in their little heads. 
So then they had to go forward and say, how can we build simple behavioral algorithms that when combined with the environment end up producing outcomes which follow these optimality solutions? And, uh, and when Kevin and I read that, we said, you know, this is great. We could use the same tools for engineering. The problem is that the, uh, the functions the behavioral ecologists used weren't quite general enough for our engineering context. So rather than switching to a new framework, we expanded their framework so that we could handle the whole family of autonomous decision making. And we published that in a robotics journal, expecting that roboticists would be interested and most interested in it, but it actually got picked up by um, a wireless communication, a set of people working on, on multi-radio networks who are trying to figure out new ways to allocate energy to radios to provide the same bandwidth at a lower cost. And using our methods that we developed from this WASP, they were able to provide the same bandwidth for lower energy than off-the-shelf methods. Now, they put foraging in the title of the paper that they published here, and they knew that foraging theory had something to do with it, but I'm sure that they had no idea that a wasp was behind it all. Now, you might ask, well, why didn't I talk more about the wasp in that paper? Because it was valuable for me to know about the wasp, so it should be valuable for them to know about the wasp. Well, the thing is, that wasp is too big for that little box, that little paper there. If I would have gone on and on and on about these parasitoid wasps in that paper, it would have never gotten published in a robotics journal. The editor would say, save that for another community. Our community is not interested in that. Keep it to the robotics. Split this into two papers because there's no reason for one community to read papers from that other community. So we kept it out. But obviously, it has some value. At least we think it has some value. I think the discipline has slightly other costs. So here's another one, a definition that I came up with. It provides an opportunity to reinvent the wheel again and again and again. It's another example. Um, the math on here doesn't quite matter, but this is a snippet from a paper written by a Nobel Memorial Prize winner in economics, William Sharp, back in uh, uh, the papers from 1966. He won the Nobel in 1990. And this is a very influential paper that tells financial uh, planners how to allocate money uh, to risky stocks so they can maximize their performance at the lowest aggregate risk. And it involves this thing called the Sharpe Ratio, which shows up in the middle of that equation. Now later on, some behavioral ecologists, like the ones who work with that wasp, started saying, how do animals allocate their time in different ways that also have risk? And they wrote a paper that uh, has a, actually the exact same ratio in it. Now, you might think that they read the financial literature and just borrowed it directly from them. You know, hurrah for interdisciplinarity. But unfortunately, they derived this all by themselves, totally ignorant of this, this uh, work over here. So the Sharpe ratio, even though it's named after a Nobel Memorial Prize winner, is, was totally gone unnoticed. When I presented this in my master's uh, defense, a behavioral ecologist in the audience said, Eureka, finally I have something to call it when I teach this stuff. <laughs> but I mean, seriously, if you look at the gap here, 1966 to 1982, that's almost 20 years where these communities could be working together. But they didn't because what do people in finance care about insects and what do people in insects care about finance? What do I think discipline should be? Discipline to me is a branch of instruction or learning. We teach our disciplines, but we practice our problem solving. I run a small lab here at ASU that I have to call the Science and Engineering of Autonomous Decision-Making Systems. People sometimes ask me, what do you do in your lab? And I give them this picture where I have this, I say, well, we link together all these different disciplines, some computer science, some cognitive psychology, and it's a nice picture. But in the end, all we really care about is whatever tools allow us to study autonomous decision-making in natural and artificial systems. And I should emphasize natural and artificial systems both equally together, not one in service of the other. Now, when I first came to ASU, they were pretty excited about this when they hired me, and I was pretty excited about the interdisciplinarity at ASU. But when I started talking to sort of the middle management of ASU, allocate resources, they're more traditional engineers, and they started asking me, why do you need a laboratory? Can't you just collaborate? Can't you just go to all these people you know here at ASU and have them run your experiments for you? Again, they brought up the tenure thing. There's no way you're gonna get tenure if you're running experiments in a lab. You're an engineer. What are you doing run, what are you asking to run, put ants in your laboratory? Well, that doesn't sound like collaboration to me. That sounds like parasitism. So 
When I interact with my collaborators, it's more about learning how they think, different directions on the same problem. We are united by the problem, not about the resources we need to get. Let me give an example of that. So here's another Nobel Prize winner, this time in physiology and medicine, Nico Timbergen. He's one of the fathers of behavioral ecology. Now, um, behavioral ecologists are interesting. When they talk about communication, they, they group things into signals and cues. Signals are the messages that we explicitly send from one person to another for the benefit of both. And cues are sort of things that we give away even though we don't mean to. And behavioral ecologists will tell you that every signal evolved from a cue that was once co-opted. Well, I had a, a graduate student in computer science who's very skilled at machine learning, and he said, that's interesting. What if I can take a bunch of robots in a string together that you'll see here and restrict them from sending any messages to each other? Um, all they can do is watch the robot right in front of them, and I'll have the lead robot will hit an object, and the goal is for all of the rest to eventually surround the object. What he found out is he could actually use the slight wiggles of the robot in the sort of the second to last robot, and the final robot could use those wiggles to infer the positions of every other robot, and thus be able to coordinate its motions based on what happened to the lead robot with absolutely no communication. And that just came from thinking about the problem like a behavioral ecologist. We also take examples from engineering and apply them directly to ants. This is another one of my students who actually works in the lab with ant colonies using theories that come out of thinking about intelligent lighting systems. We go further and further. We have information processing where we have a team of a multidisciplinary team where we actually have a swarm roboticist doing all of the experimental work with the ant and somebody who studies the way planets break apart and come back together doing all of the modeling work with the ants. We have uh, another recently started project where we've hired a tropical ecologist to come and do work with these beautiful army ants all in the service of understanding how information will be passed around the Internet of Things. And this was a project where, although we had all the skill sets to come together to put this together, the military actually came up with this idea. They said, we don't see anything really valuable in a lot of the way the Internet of Things is being organized with this particular problem in mind. We think insects might have something to say. Can you do something for us? So looking ahead, we have a lot of these other projects. Um, where we're just basically, I'm not going to go through all these, but the idea here is we're grouping people together by problems they're interested in and not resources that they have. So I guess the message for you in thinking about innovation is I'm, I'm hoping that as you move forward and try to be innovative, be undisciplined. What do we mean by that? Remember that your discipline is what you teach. Your discipline is not what you learn, and it certainly shouldn't be defining what you do. Thank you.